Hi everyone, and welcome to this lecture titled Basic Atomic Theory. Throughout this lecture we'll be dealing with atoms and the makeup of these atoms, which is very important because it's really hard to understand the, the inner workings of electronic circuits without first getting a grasp of all the little tiny atoms that make up all of those different components within that circuit. Now the first thing I want to say is that what you're seeing on the screen here is a PDF that I've made. You can actually download this PDF from the resources section. So I highly recommend that you do that either while following along, you can have a look at it, or you can even um, print it off and, and use it for your own studies later on. So let's get into the atom. Now something I want to show you first is this. This is a piece of aluminium foil, or if you're from America, aluminum foil. This here, funny enough, is made up of a whole heap of aluminium atoms. So we can find out a little bit about this aluminium atom by going to www.ptable.com. Really cool website that shows you uh, the periodic table of elements and it shows you, um, it's very interactive. You can click on things and it will give you links to different things. You can even increase the temperature and find out what turns into a solid or a, a liquid or a gas at different temperatures. Really, really cool. At the moment, all we want to do is we want to find aluminium on this table. And because I know where it is, it's very quick for me to find. It's right there. AL is the abbreviation for aluminium. Now it's got some numbers on here. What do these numbers mean? Well, if we have a look at the top left, we've got the number 13. And then over to the right, we've got 2, 8, and 3. So 13, and then 2, 8, and 3. Now come back over here with me. Think of the solar system. So we live in a solar system with the sun in the center, and then we have all these planets orbiting around the sun. So you can kind of have that in the back of your mind for, a, for what an atom actually looks like. So here in the center of the atom is called the nucleus. It's like the sun. Inside the nucleus, we've got a couple of things. We've got these little red positive things. They're our protons. They have a positive charge, and we'll talk about charges a bit later on. There's 13 of those in here. So if we were to count all these, we'd find there's 13. Come back here. Look, there's the number 13. So the number 13 in the top left in the periodic table of elements tells us there are 13 protons in that atom. That's very good. Now, if we have a look outside the nucleus, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 of these little black things which are called electrons. If we have a look over here, you've got 2 plus 8 is 10 plus 3 is 13. The 2, 8 and 3 tells us how many electrons they are, uh, there are in the atom. Now the electrons are the opposite of protons if you like, they have a negative charge. So I guess in a roundabout way you can think about magnets. Magnets have a north pole and a south pole. The north pole if you put it near a south pole, they're going to attract each other. But if you put a north pole near a north pole, they repel. Um, so we've got, they're kind of the opposite. North and south is the opposite to our positive and negative here. But we'll deal with that a little bit later. Now, you'll also notice that we had the number 2, then 8, then 3. Well, that tells us that we've got two atoms orbiting pretty close to the, uh, sorry, two electrons orbiting pretty close to the nucleus. And then we go outside that a little further, and we've got eight electrons orbiting around the nucleus. And then we go further out again, and we get to the very last ring. In fact, we call these rings shells. And we've got three. So we've got two, then further out, eight, then further out, three. Now we give this special outside shell uh, um, a special name. They call it the valence shell. And that'll be important, well, that'll be very important later on, because this is... Um, something that really helps us to understand how electricity and ele electronic circuits work. So where are we up to? I started talking about this aluminium foil. I then went to the periodic table of the elements and I found al aluminium on this table. We found out there was 13 protons, that's the top left number, and then 2 plus 8 plus 3 is 13 electrons, and that there's three shells. The 2 is the shell closest to the nucleus, then we go further out, there's 8, and then there's 3. Remember the outside shell which has three is called a valence shell. And by the way, we've got 14 neutrons. They have no charge whatsoever. In fact, they don't even write that on here. We, we can completely ignore that for this lecture. Okay, so that's the general makeup of an atom. But remember, there's not just one atom. There's, there's all sorts of atoms. For example, I've got this here. This is a certain electronic component called a resistor. These little wires coming out of it are made of copper. If I have a look down here, copper is another type of atom or another type of element, and it's got the number 29. So it's got 29 protons in the nucleus, 
And if you look on the outside, with the electrons, we've got two closest to the nucleus, then eight going further out, then 18, then one. So it's actually got four shells, and if you count them all up, there's 29 electrons. So all different types of atoms, which is really important because all different types of components means there's going to be all different types of atoms. Okay, so bear with me because we're going to get to somewhere that actually helps us with electronics. Now there's a few forces within an atom. So if you think um, of a solar system, you get these planets spinning around and around and around and around. around. They're actually attracted to the sun due to gravity. So the sun would like to pull them in due to that gravitational force. We have a similar thing with the electrons. The electrons spinning around and around and around are actually getting attracted into the center, the nucleus, because the electrons are negative, and inside the nucleus we've got these positive protons. They're trying to pull those electrons in, kind of like a north pole trying to pull in a south pole within a magnet. But why don't they get pulled in? Well, remember they're spinning around and around and around and around, as they're spinning, so think about when you go on a merry-go-round, if you're spinning on a merry-go-round, you're, you're really trying to hold yourself in there because you, the, the actual force, which we call centrifugal force, is trying to fling you out away from the, um, the merry-go-round. So as these electrons are spinning, they're actually experiencing this other force which is trying to pull them away from the nucleus. So we've got these two forces, one trying to attract them in and one trying to pull them out. Now the last force we have is We've got all these electrons which are near each other. They're trying to get away from each other. Kind of like how a south pole would try and get away from a south pole. So that's why we can keep these electrons on their each individual shell rather than uh, being all on the one shell. All right, next page. <clears throat> we get different amounts of energy within our atom. So we're just going to be looking at the electrons at the moment. The electrons all the way on the outside have the most energy. Remember, the outside shell is called the valence shell, and that these electrons in the valence shell have the most amount of energy out of any of them. As you get closer to the center, closer to the nucleus, the electrons have less energy. So that'll be important for later on. Okay, so we've been speaking about these atoms, but you may still have in your head, well, who really cares? I mean, how does this actually help me with electronics? Well, that's a good question. <clears throat> Here is an electronic component again, and I've got these legs coming off it, these bits of wire, and they're made out of a special type of metal called copper. Copper is what we would call a conductor. It allows elect electricity to flow, if I can use that term at the moment. So if we read out conductors, atoms with one, two, or three electrons in their valence shell are really good at allowing their electrons to leave the valence shell and move somewhere else. We therefore call them a conductor. Materials such as copper, aluminium, and gold are great conductors. Okay, so now we're starting to get somewhere. When we're dealing with atoms, we get all of these protons in the middle and electrons going around the nucleus. The electrons are actually what flows through a circuit. So if I was to have a look at this piece of wire connected to this component, this piece of wire, which is made up of copper, has all of these tiny, tiny, tiny atoms inside that thing. Now, if we were to zoom in on the atoms, we'd see there's electrons uh, orbiting around the atom. Now, it's these electrons, when we connect it up to some kind of battery or something, that we can push through that wire. Now, some atoms allow those electrons to move from atom to atom really, really easily. In fact, atoms with one, two, or three electrons in their valence shell, remember the valence shell is the outside shell, if we have one, two, or three electrons, and we connect that to a battery, we can easily get those electrons to move through the circuit and cause stuff to happen. Now, how do we know that um, whether our, our atom that we're looking at is a good conductor? Well, remember, we can have a look at this periodic table of elements, and we can have a look. There's the protons, 13. Here's the electrons, closest to, uh, next closest, 8, and then the furthest out, which is the valence shell that has 3. So aluminium, therefore, falls under the category of a good conductor because it's got one, two, or three valence shell electrons, in this case three. So it's not too hard to get electrons to jump around through those all those different atoms and flow through the circuit when we're dealing with aluminium. What about copper? Well, copper has two, then eight, then 18, then one. We're just concerned with the very last one, which is the one. It has one electron in the valence shell. Therefore, when we connect it up to a battery or some kind of power source, it's going to be really easy to get the electrons in copper to flow through. 
Now, as we start to add more electrons to the valence shell, it gets a little bit harder. So I'm going to jump down here for the moment to, uh, sorry, <laughs> insulators. So it's got here, it is quite hard to cause the valence shell electrons to jump out of the valence shell if we use atoms that have five, six, seven, or eight uh, valence shell electrons. In fact, you can't get any more than eight in the valence shell. Eight is the maximum. So it's got here, we therefore call this sort of material an insulator. Good insulators are nitrogen, oxygen, and neon. So if we were to grab some stuff, like this pen, and the, the atoms that this stuff was made out of had five, six, seven, or eight electrons in the valence shell, it would be really hard to connect that to a power supply and get those electrons to actually jump from atom to atom. So let's have a look at the table of elements here. Nitrogen has five valence shell electrons, so it is not a very good conductor. We call it an insulator. It's very hard to get the electrons to flow through that thing. Oxygen has six. Um, neon has eight. So anything with five, six, seven, or eight electrons in the valence shell, it's, it's, the electrons are going to be very hard to move along the place, so we call it an insulator. In fact, that's why we have uh, wires such as, oh, there's a wire. Oh, here we go. Here's a little USB thing. This here inside that white strip there is going to be some copper wire because we want the electrons to flow through there. But we don't just want that copper wire to touch other things and, and cause short circuits and, and malfunctions. So we put on the outside of that an insulator, which um, has five, six, seven or eight valence shell electrons, which doesn't allow those electrons to flow through. And we'll talk about that later as we go through different lectures. Now the last one I want to show you here is what we call semiconductors. So one, two, or three is a good conductor. Five, six, seven, and eight valence shells is a good insulator. In between those two is what we call a semiconductor. Atoms with exactly four valence shell electrons are somewhat in between a conductor and an insulator. We call them a semiconductor. Good semiconductors are silicon, and you may have heard of silicon chips before, or germanium. So if we have a look here, there's silicon. There's the number four right down the bottom, which means the valence shell has four electrons. It's not a good insulator, it's not a good conductor. In fact, later on, we, um, in a lecture that I'll most probably do in some other course, we will learn about silicon and germanium and how we can make them perform in electronic circuits. Straight down from silicon is germanium, and it also has four valence shell electrons. So it's not a good insulator because it doesn't have five, six, seven, or eight electrons in the valence shell. It's not a good conductor because it doesn't have one, two, or three in the valence shell. And it's got down here, remember that the most electrons that you can have in a valence shell is eight. And that's every, every uh, thing that we see on the periodic table of elements. Now I've mentioned this a few times, so why do we care about all this theory about atoms? Well, we care again because here's a circuit board, which is electronic, it has all these components. All these components are made up of atoms and different types of atoms. It's important that we understand these atoms to figure out well, how these circuits are going to work when we connect them to a power supply. If we connect up some stuff that has one, two, or three electrons in their valence shell, then it's going to allow electrons to tr flow through the circuit really, really quickly. But if we've got stuff that has uh, five, six, seven, or eight electrons, then it's not going to work so well. So something you can think about this is, if you put your hands together and rub them for a while, what actually starts to happen? Well, they start to get hot. The reason they get hot is because of friction. So if you have a little bit of a think about that, if we connect up a battery, and by the way, this is a symbol for a simple battery. If we connect that with some copper wire or aluminium wire to a light bulb, what we're going to have is we're going to have the battery pushing these electrons through the circuit. Those electrons go through this light bulb and back through to here. Just as we rub our hands together and we create friction, which generates heat, those electrons traveling through the circuit are actually bumping into all these other um, atoms in there, knocking other electrons loose, causing friction. Friction causes heat, and we design our light bulbs to really make use of that heat to generate light. So if we were to use some other material such as, um, such that would be a good insulator, we connect it to the battery and, and nothing would happen because we need those electrons to be able to flow through the circuit for stuff to happen. So just about the last page here, we've got here neutral atoms and positive and negative ions. So if, looking back at the periodic, periodic table of the elements, aluminium has 13 protons, and if you count them up, 2 plus 8 plus 3 is 13 electrons. 
The protons and electrons are opposite to one another. So one is positive, one is negative. But since there's an equal number of protons as there are electrons, they cancel each other out and we call it neutral. So it has no charge whatsoever. But, and we'll learn this later on, <clears throat> if we were to take electrons out of that, for example, if we took one electron away from 13, now we have 12, there's now 13 protons in this aluminium atom, only 12 electrons, so we would call it a positive ion because there's more positives than there are negatives. The positives win the battle, and so we call it a positive ion. But what would happen if we cause this to get an extra electron from some other atom? So now it's got more than 13, it's got 14. Well, now there's more electrons than there are protons, we'd call it a negative ion. And that'll be quite important when we talk about batteries a little bit later on. So it's neutral if it's got equal positive negative, it's positive ion if it's got more positive than negative, so more protons than uh, electrons. And we call the negative ion if it's got more electrons than protons. So in conclusion, matter is made up of atoms. So just like this, this is matter, it's made of atoms. Atoms are made up of a nucleus containing protons and neutrons in the center, and electrons orbiting around that. Different atoms have different amounts of protons, neutrons, electrons, and shells, as we saw in the periodic table of the elements. The outer shell is always called the valence shell, and it can only ever have eight electrons in it. If we have one, two, or three electrons in that valence shell, it's a good conductor. So we connect it to a battery, and we get electrons to flow through the place. But if it's got five, six, seven, or eight, then it's not a good conductor. It actually prevents those electrons from moving around the place. If it's got four electrons in its valence shell, we call it a semiconductor, and that'll be covered in a later uh, lecture module or, or something like that. Adding energy, normally in the form of a battery or power supply to a conductor, will cause the electrons to break free from the valence shell and travel through the material, bouncing from atom to atom. This is how we can make electronic appliances work, simply moving electrons from one place to the other. All right, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Have a look at the test, and um, hopefully you do very well in it.